doctor of MS and treatment of MS. And what I really think that, uh, as the second part of the program, talking about more about being healthy and being well, that I like to sort of look at a bigger picture, which is kind of quality of life. So what I wanted to bring up today are some issues that greatly affect MS patients' quality of life that may not be directly from their MS, although we could argue these things are caused by their MS and therefore are from their MS. But they certainly are things that commonly people don't think about to bring up with their doctor. Doctors don't think about to bring up with their patients, quite frankly, including me. So from my patients, I say, oh, I need to talk to him about this myself, okay? And, uh, and then I think one nice thing for patients when they get you know, a physician uh, to talk to who's not their doctor, it gives them a chance to ask all those questions they're dying to ask their regular doctor, uh, doctor but uh, are afraid to ask, or maybe my uh, patients are just afraid to take up the time that we have to ask those things. So I did want to leave quite a bit of time for questions from you guys, and clearly y'all can ask me about anything you want. Okay. Um, from my standpoint, I'm, I'm a little unique among the MS doctors in town in that, I mean, Houston, like, quite frankly, is very blessed to have a lot of really excellent MS uh, physicians. We have two very good MS centers. They probably take care of about half the patients with MS. And then we have some other uh, physicians like myself who have a general practice or specialize in something, including taking care of patients with MS. And sometimes I think one of the strengths of not being at an MS center is that we think about some of these things and take care of some of these other things. So I think that's also why sometimes those things are Overlook. So if you think this stuff applies to you, I really urge you to talk to your doctor about them because at least for many patients with MS, their immediate quality of life is not so much due to the MS, but due to some of these other things. So the first thing I want to talk about is migraines. Migraines is near and dear to my heart because I have migraines. Okay? I actually got them after I became a resident in neurology. So I didn't choose this field because of my migraines, but I did choose to spend a lot of time in migraines because of my personal migraines. And migraines and headaches and MS uh, greatly impact patients' quality of life. So there's data now, I am told by the authors, although I haven't seen the papers not yet published, that actually will prove what a number of us have thought for a long time, is that migraines are more common in patients with MS in general. Okay, it's hard to know that for sure, just from taking care of patients because the average woman in her 30s, about 30% of them will have migraines. And therefore, when you're seeing a lot of your MS patients, which are female and young, it's hard to know whether that's just the 30% chance or whether it's actually a cause. But I'm told by Dr. Uh, Lipton, and he's an expert in epidemiology of migraines, that the paper they have in press will actually show that this is indeed a comorbid disease. This is overrepresented among patients who have MS. So how do you know if you have migraines? And basically, it's very simple and not nearly as complex as people want to make it out to be. So if you have headaches that are all disabling, you only have to have one of these features I'm going to name off, and then you at least have what's called a probable migraine. And that's actually a formal diagnosis that headache researchers use. But the overwhelming data is that probable migraine is Migraine. So basically, if you ever have a disabling headache and it is throbbing, or one-sided, or makes you nauseated, or you have light and noise sensitivity, or if your headache is worse when you move around, you at least have probable migraines, and therefore you probably have migraines. Okay? And why is that important? Because there's great drugs for migraines these days. Okay? The days of suffering with your he headaches and staying in bed is is uncommon now for most patients with migraines. We have great drugs for when you have an acute migraine. Then more importantly, if you have frequent headaches, which most headache people will say one and a half times per week on average, so in other words, two or more times a week, then you probably should be on a headache prevention drug so you don't get so many. But that's sort of an individual choice. If your headaches are often enough and bad enough that you would choose to take a pill every day to prevent them, then you probably ought to consider that. So if you have headaches that are interfering with your life, I urge you to bring that up with your doctor who takes care of you. And quite frankly, if they don't take an interest or you don't get it anywhere, then you may need to see somebody who doesn't just treat MS before that. But most patients can be treated really well for, for their migraines. Another thing that really did, uh, doesn't fall into a comorbid disease, but I just thought I had to uh, bring it up because it's such a big deal for those patients who have it 
is some patients with MS have a lot of pain, okay? And their pain is stinging, stabbing, burning, shooting, okay? Those are what we call, quote, neuropathic pains. With MS, it's actually, quote, a central pain. In other words, there's no fire on your feet, but your feet burn, okay? Well, we think with MS, there's no problem with your peripheral nervous system, so therefore, if you touch your hand down there and there is indeed no fire on your feet, okay, then presumably it's something from your brain, so that's called a central pain. There are absolutely zero drugs approved by the FDA for central pain. There's really good drugs even studied for central pain. The closest thing we have for drugs studied for central pain is to look at fibromyalgia, which is a real disease in my opinion, despite what the Houston Chronicle wrote up, I think it was just yesterday or the day before about this being a quote, murky disease. Maybe murky for the author, okay? And maybe murky for some of the patients he spoke to. But I can assure you that is a real disease as much as depression is a real disease and anxiety is a real disease and migraine is a real disease that has no blood tests and has no imaging abnormality, which is what they're kind of focused on for that disease, okay? And we do have a couple of drugs that are FDA approved to treat fibromyalgia. And they are Cymbalta and Lyrica, just to get out my biases, I do speak for Lyrica about their drug and fibromyalgia and pain. Okay, and before we had those drugs, those drugs have been on the market for five years or so, give or take. We would use uh, get, uh, gabapentin or Neurontin, which is kind of a weaker sister of Lyrica, and amitriptyline or Elevil, which is sort of a weaker sister of Cymbalta, or maybe a better way to say that drug is just a lot more side effects. So if you can take enough amitriptyline, it works just like Cymbalta, but because the side effects, most people just can't take it. Besides those drugs, we've used uh, Tegretol for a number of years, or carbamazepine for uh, central pain. And so if you have burning, stinging, stabbing pain, those are the kind of drugs you need to be talking to your doctor about. The, narcotic type drugs that are out on the market that most neurologists shy away from. We shy away from them because they actually have not been shown to be particularly useful for those kinds of pain. Those drugs are proven for people who have surgery. Those drugs are proven for people who have uh, a root canal, that's a typical model, and post childbirth is another model. So if you have physical injury to your body, okay, either because you self-induced it with playing too much basketball on a weekend, or because somebody, you know, hit you over the leg and you broke something, okay, those drugs have been shown to work. But there's no reason to know that those drugs would work for something that's completely different. So I wanted to bring up pain because if you have chronic pain, that's a huge emotional burden and a huge impact on your quality of life. And nowadays, unfortunately, the drugs for that are not as good as our drugs for, let's say, migraine. We've not had the breakthrough drug that I would say is the equivalent of a Prozac for central pain or an Imitrex for central pain, but they are better than what we've had even five years ago. And so maybe you've had your problem for 15 years, learned nobody could do anything about it 12 years ago and haven't brought it up since because we didn't realize there was something new.